Good morning and welcome to St Paul's Cathedral once more for our diocesan act of worship. With me today is Reverend Tracy Woolsey. Welcome Tracy. Thank you. And uh, we will be sharing in the worship t- together today and Bishop Matt will be speaking to us the second in his series. And so we begin. Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right, for soon my salvation will come and my deliverance be revealed. Open our lips, O Lord, and and we we shall shall declare declare your praise. This is the day that the Lord has made. We We will rejoice rejoice and and be glad glad in it. it. Our canticle this morning is the Song of Isaiah. And we say together, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. On that day you will say, Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the nations. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing God's praises who has triumphed gloriously. Let this be known in all the world. Shout and sing for joy, you that dwell in Zion. For great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. And now we take this opportunity to draw near to God with sincerity and confidence as we pray together. Merciful God, our Maker and our Judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart, We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? My God, I cry to you by day, but you do not answer, and by night also I take no rest. But you continue holy, you that are the praise of Israel. In you our forebears trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and they were saved. They put their trust in you and were not confounded. But as for me, I am a worm and no man, the scorn of all and despised by the people. Those that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out their lips at me and wag their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord, let him deliver him. He trust, let him deliver him if he delights in him. But you are he that took me out of the womb, that brought me to lie at peace on my mother's breast. On you have I been cast since my birth. You are my God, even from my mother's womb. Oh, go not from me, for trouble is hard at hand and there is none to help. Many oxen surround me. Fat bulls of Bashan close me in on every side. 
They gape wide their mouths at me, like lions that roar and rend. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart within my breast is like melting wax. My mouth is tried up like a pot's herb, and my tongue clings to my gums. My hands and my feet are withered, and you lay me in the dust of death. For many dogs have come about me, and a band of evildoers hem me in. I can count all my bones. They stand staring and gazing upon me. They part my garments among them, and cast lots for my clothing. O oh Lord, do not stand far off. You are my helper, hasten to my aid. Deliver my body from the sword, my life from the power of the dogs. O oh, save me from the lion's mouth, and my afflicted soul from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my companions. In the midst of the congregation will I praise you. I praise the Lord, all you that fear him. Hold him in honour, O seed of Jacob, and let the seed of Israel stand in awe of him. For he has not despised nor abhorred the poor man in his misery, nor did he hide his face from him, but heard him when he cried. From you springs my praise in the great congregation. I'll pay my vows in the sight of all that fear you. The meek shall eat of the sacrifice and be satisfied. And those who seek the Lord shall praise him. May their hearts rejoice forever. Let all the ends of the earth remember and turn to the Lord. And let all the families of the nations worship before him. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he shall be ruler over the nations. How can those who sleep in the earth do him homage, or those that descend to the dust bow down before him? But he has saved my life for himself, and my posterity shall serve him. This shall be told of my Lord to a future generation, and his righteousness declared to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. Creator Spirit, advocate promised by our Lord Jesus, increase our faith and help us to walk in the light of your presence to the glory of God the Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We have now readings from the scriptures and that will be followed by the reflection from Bishop Matt. Many oxen surround me. Fat bulls of Bashan close me in on every side. They gape wide their mouths at me, like lions that roar and rend. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart within my breast is like melting wax. My mouth is dried up like a pot's herd, and my tongue clings to my gums. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope, that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labour pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, 
For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the spirit, because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Good morning again, friends. It's great to be with you this Sunday morning. Bishop Matt here. Now, I've always enjoyed that snippet from the play, The Importance of Being Earnest, that great play by Oscar Wilde, uh, which Mr. Worthing is being told off for being an orphan. Uh, to lose one parent, Mr. Worthing, may be regarded as a misfortune. To lose both looks like carelessness. I love the, the wry look at the, the unpredictability of life or the way that circumstances just wash over you. And the sideways nod to the question, well, who's to blame if things don't go right or don't go as expected? Now today we're uh, thinking more about um, the theme of disappointment. Last week we talked about disappointment with God. This week we're talking about disappointment with the circumstances of life. And I mean circumstances very broadly. So not those things at which God uh, should have some share in, so where we feel disappointed with God. Not those things where we're disappointed with people, but the other aspects of life that just uh, seem to wash over, a bit like Mr Worthing. To lose one parent might be misfortune, to lose two? Well, that's just carelessness. What do we do when we're disappointed by the circumstances of life? Now last week, as we thought about disappointment and thought, well, if, if disappointment was a beast and we were looking to create an anatomy of disappointment, it'd have two parts. It was, on one hand, uh, unmet expectations. So those hopes and dreams that didn't come through or a lack of vindication being uh, left, uh, well, embarrassed that you put your faith in the wrong, the wrong place. Now, if disappointment has those two parts, or if that's the anatomy of disappointment, then as we think about the circumstances of life, I think there, there are also two parts or two dimensions to how we can think about them. And the first is the internal aspects, those, those things that, that happen that affect us within ourselves, things that are internal to us. So it might be uh, an illness or um, an injury or uh, discovering that you lack the capacities that you'd hoped you might have. So in my mind, I think, well, that's, that's actually part of dealing with the circumstances of life, those internal things. Others are external. You know, those those aspects of life that just sort of wash over us, the things that we can't control, the things that just happen, happen around. I had two dreams as I was growing up. One is that I'd run in the 100 metres for Australia. The other is that I'd stride the stages of the world in a heavy metal band. And friends, I can tell you that one of those dreams will never come true. Well, I can disclose for you which one that is, and that is to run for Australia in the 100 metres. And I tell you this, that joke because it helps to illustrate what I'm saying about the two dimensions of disappointment in the circumstances of life. So I loved running, I was reasonably good, and it was uh, the, the short events that were, were mine. The, the shorter the event, the better. In Europe, they run 60 metres indoors. In Australia, not so frequently. If we had that race, I would have loved that. So 100 metres is mine. But I can remember significant disappointment time after time and not being picked for 
teams. I might have had the fastest time uh, in my age group, but then being passed over for various reasons, whether I hadn't been consistent enough or whether I just wasn't familiar with the selectors. That's an example of external things, things that, that I really had no control over, but were part of the circumstances of life that could create a background disappointment. But alongside not being picked for significant events were things that were happening internally. So uh, from about the age of 18, I just had a run of significant injuries, injury after injury after injury. And I can vividly remember, still remember when uh, the, the large muscle in the front, front of my thigh, so one of my quadricep muscles tore. I've still got the divot in my thigh where the muscle uh, has only imperfectly grown, grown back. It felt like someone had thrown a cricket ball at my leg and collapsed to the ground. Now, that was not something that I could bear any fault over, but it, that was a circumstance of life that I had to, had to deal with that created great disappointment. And then it rolled even further. Of course, there was the disappointment in the, the physical injury, but then managing the sadness of the lost dreams as it became more and more apparent that the injury meant that I couldn't run as fast as I may have otherwise hoped. So do you see how there's both the external, the things that happen around the outside of us, but then there's also the internal things that are just part and parcel of being a human being, part of living with an unpredictable world. It's those that I'm calling the circumstances of life. So what do we do? How do we understand disappointment with the world that we operate in? And what do we do with it? And so today we're, we're taking a look at Romans chapter 8, the, the last part of Romans chapter 8. It's a very famous passage, but in this section we actually get stepped through some of the reasons why our world can be so disappointing and then a glimpse at what to do about it. So let's dive in. Why is the world so disappointing so often? Romans 8 verse 18 begins with Paul talking about the sufferings of this present time. And he contrasts that with a picture of the future. There's a comparison with, with glory that will be revealed in the future. Now this connects with the previous parts of, of Romans chapter 8 at which Paul talks about the reality of being drawn into God's family, being made heirs of everything that Jesus would inherit. And that raises the question, if we've been made heirs, if as Christians we've been brought into God's family and made heirs with Jesus of incredible riches, why do things will not pan out in such a good way here and now in the everyday. And so this is where Paul is beginning in Romans 8, 18, when he says, I consider the sufferings of this present time not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. So here Paul is putting a marker down that our present existence can be so often so fraught with all sorts of things that don't match with what we understand to be our inheritance as we uh, tie our future to Jesus. And so hence, the comparison with the future now pales into insignificance with what will be revealed in us, to us, in the future. Now, some people criticise Christianity then and say, well, it's all about pie in the sky where you die. It's just a way of controlling you in the present and putting up with a substandard life now in the hope, some vague notion that you might get something good later on. Well, they're actually missing the point here because what Paul is doing is, is saying really clearly to, to people, sooner or later you'll meet a crushing reality that even the strongest of us are not actually sufficient to win through against the forces arrayed against us. Let's go back to my example. I could persevere with disappointment about not being picked. I could push harder. I could uh, perhaps uh, lobby a bit harder. I could find the right training group to be part of. But what happened when my quadricep tore? There was a crushing reality that even the strongest, even the most canny person couldn't push through. So that criticism that Christianity is just all about, well, putting your hope in a pie in the sky when you die, 
actually ignores the basic reality that Paul talks about here, and that is that of the crushing reality that even the strongest will not win through everything. There is suffering, and with that suffering comes the possibility of disappointment. Now Paul steps through, I think, four reasons why this is so. So from verse 20 he talks about the creation, and by creation Paul means everything that's not us. Okay? Um, it's his way, particularly in Romans, of talking about the world that sits outside of us. He talks about the creation being subjected to futility and being in bondage. Now, we experience the aftermath or the spillover of that with, well, because it's overwhelming, because the world we interact with can be frustrating, it can be downright bad, and, and sometimes it can just seem pointless as we try and interact with, with the world around us. And Paul says that this is actually a, a, a bondage that the creation is in. It, it's, there's a futility wired into the world and that's why the overwhelming nature, the frustrating nature, the, the, the badness and the pointless nature of the world comes out. In other words, Paul's saying the world as we experience isn't as it should be. It's not as it should be. It might be usual, it might be common, but it's actually not what it should be. And here he's harking back to Genesis chapter 3, right at the very beginning of the Bible. Now you'll remember that in Genesis 1 and 2 we get two tellings of the creation story, how God made the world and delighted in the world and, and made it so that it was good and even better than that, it was very good. It was a way of saying that God delighted in everything he'd made and it was wonderful. It just worked smoothly. It was in harmony with its creator. But in Genesis chapter 3 we see everything go wrong. Adam and Eve uh, metaphorically shook their fist in God's face. They said, well look, we're happy to enjoy the benefits but we're doing it our way. God, thank you very much. You can well move off to the side. And the consequence of that was God stepping in, intervening. And it had not only consequences for Adam and Eve, but it had consequences for the world within which they lived. And the idea of futility is woven in there. So rather than a world that was just beautifully productive, where things that were good to eat just flourished and things that were wonderful to look at just flourished, it would suddenly become a place where Adam and Eve had to work by the sweat of their brow where weeds would suddenly become a presence, where thickets and thorns would come up instead of uh, food that could be eaten. And so here Paul begins by explaining why things can be, well, there can be so much suffering and why the potential for the disappointment is there, and that is because of this futility and bondage that creation is in, and that is tied back to Adam and Eve, us, shaking our fist in God's face, saying, Nick off, my way, not yours. And that then flows through to this experience of groaning. And this is where I see that Paul is tying the suffering, if you like, the objective statement about what it's like to live in this world with the subject experience, subjective experience. So the creation groans and Paul uses the vivid uh, illustration in verse 22 of a woman in labour pains groaning. Now. That is vivid, isn't it? And I think he deliberately uses that image to speak to the heart. It's as if those of us who are disappointed can suddenly have our hearts relax and say, oh, now you're talking, you're, you're talking about my experience. So the futility and bondage that the world exists under has the subjective experience, not only for it, but as it spills over with us, of groaning. Now friends, we'll pause here for a moment. And I'm going to say this very carefully because I don't want to be misunderstood. If there is a value in a time like the one that we're living through, I'm not saying that it's good, I'm not saying that we should uh, celebrate this time, but if there is a value in a time like this, 
then it actually exposes us to this groaning. The reality is that we live in an environment that's so much more comfortable than almost every other part of the world. And we're very often insulated to the effect of this futility. And if there is a value in a time like this, it means that we are experiencing that groan, that sense of, well, what is the consequence of the futility that the world has found itself in? Then the third point that Paul makes from verse 22 is this is actually an experience we share. It's, a, and it's an experience that's shared across all of creation. Remember the non-human parts of what God made. It's the whole of creation groans. It's not in patches where some are like this and some are others. It's actually a common experience across the whole. But it extends even to people and extends even further than that in verse 23 to those of us who have become Christian. He uses the delightful phrase, those of us who have experienced the first fruits of the Spirit, the beginning of what we will inherit from Jesus. See, disappointment with the circumstances of life is indiscriminate. It's a common experience. It's something that is shared across all of humanity, across all of creation. Now, friends, this is actually a real opportunity for us, those of us who are Christian, not to gloss over things. See, too often, particularly in our world, we, we try and shove the disappointing aspects of life, the bits where our groaning is exposed, to the, to the dirty corners where we can ignore them. We don't like talking about them. We don't like actually thinking about what to do about them. We don't like, well, addressing them, especially addressing them as an artefact of this futility, this bondage that the world is under. But don't gloss over it. Here's an experience that we share with every other person. Explore that. Use it as a way of, of moving beyond the weather and the football and to, to talk with people about what it is that they're experiencing in life. Because just as you experience that groaning, so will they. And then Paul ends his diagnosis of why the world is so disappointing with a hidden mercy. Back in verse 20, I wonder whether you heard a word that, that in the Greek it's quite clear, in the English it's less clear. For the creation was subjected to futility. It's that word was subjected. For those of you who like grammar, that is a passive way of using the word. In Greek it's very clear, they've got a, a whole different way of forming up the word to show that it's passive, but it means that something is done to something else rather than the thing doing it itself. So this, this futility was done to creation. And friends, for us that is a hidden mercy because the question is, well, who did it and why did they do it? And the clue is the hope that comes later on in verse 20. For creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. Friends, if the groaning is the signal for us that this bondage or futility is there, then the fact that it was put upon creation is a signal that the dislocation from God actually has consequences and is not good. Friends, it's God's refusal to allow us and all of creation to go on a merry road away from God without realising the basic consequence. And so then this disappointment has a hidden mercy. It pulls us up short. It confronts us with the reality of what running away from God looks like. And that's true, whether we're a Christian or whether we're not. So what do we do about it? Is there any hope? Well, as the rest of the passage plays out, we see that Paul does introduce great hope. There are three things he says, three things we can do about it. And he introduces those three things, each of them with, as a pair. 
The first pair is about us and what we must do. The second pair is about God and what God will do. And then the third pair, well, we share it. Something about us and something about God. So that first pair is hope and patience. And so from verse 24, For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Friends, I don't think that the Christian life is talking about pie in the sky when you die. You know, putting up with bad stuff now, just on the, the vague chance you'll get something good later on. Otherwise, why would we pray, uh, your kingdom come on earth as in heaven? I think it's a, 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 a total distortion of what the Christian message is to say that, that Christianity is pie in the sky when you die. Jesus told us to pray that God's kingdom would come on earth as in heaven. But what Paul introduces is that fulfillment is only complete when Jesus returns. I'll say it again. The fullness of what we will inherit will only be complete when Jesus returns. It's like we have a glass of cool water on a hot day and now we get to drink from that glass but it will not be filled up to the brim and never ending until Jesus returns. So that's why Paul talks about us having the first fruits. We have the beginnings but not the full fruits. And so this is where the role of hope and patience comes in. For those of us who can perceive the beginnings of what God is doing and indeed get to experience the beginnings of what it means to be bound to Jesus, then we hope for the fulfilment of that and we wait with patience. So here is one practice to help as we're disappointed with that crushing futility of life. What is one practice that can help us live into that hope with patience? Or well, pause, actually take time deliberately each day, each week, each month, each year to ponder the things of God's kingdom. Visualize them, rehearse them in your mind, remember them, learn scriptures that tell you about them and quote them. And the effect that this has is of setting our affection, our heart on what God is bringing, on what is to be fulfilled. And that will also bring up this sense of holy discontent with the okay. One of the traps of our world is we put up with things that are okay, even good, and miss what is great. And so as we ponder the things of God, quite deliberately set aside time to remind us what God is bringing and what God will fulfill when Jesus returns, we won't be satisfied with what is merely okay. And the side benefit is that we will actually have eyes to see where the first fruits are. Those things that we've missed because we're trapped within a certain way of operating in this world. So ponder the things of God's kingdom. Now if that's what we must do, what is it that God will do? And we see that from verse 26, and that is sighing and searching. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. Have you ever had that experience that the disappointment brings us to such a point that we're just bewildered to, to know how to, how to deal with it, know how to bring it to God? For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God who searches the heart knows what the mind of the spirit is because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So sighing and searching. Friends, we know from this passage that help is at hand. And disappointment then, which is often attended by the inability to actually parse or describe adequately what's going on for us is not the end of the story that God is so much for us that God's self in the person of the Spirit will act as the translator of our disappointment to God. And so the practice to, to help 
as we realise that God delights in being the one who, who translates our groaning so that he can do something about it, is to articulate the worry, articulate the worry and the hurt. Not as a gossip session or a whinge session with others, but in prayer. And so take time to, to write it in a diary or draw up a list or, or even on an exercise book, write on one side of the page the things that you're disappointed about and leave the other side blank so that as you discover answers, you see eyes to see, you have eyes to see how God is, well, fulfilling what he's doing. You can write it in on the other side. But actually pay time, give yourself time to articulate the worry and then hand it over to God to do the translation, to make sense of all of the, the mixed up disappointments that we have and straighten it out. Actually make it something that is workable in his plan because God promises to do the sighing and the searching so that the overwhelming nature of our disappointment doesn't overwhelm us, is able to then meet us in that need. And so if our role is then to persevere with hope, and then God's role is to search us out and make sense of our sighings, then where we meet is knowing and yearning. God knows us, and we must yearn for God. And so from verse 28, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are according, are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. Isn't that a cool image? Jesus isn't just the firstborn, but it's a large family that we've been drawn into. That he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This takes us back to the hidden mercy that the groaning in this world has. Friends, God is not surprised by our disappointment with living in this world. And that's the point of this long chain of consequences that ends with this sense of predestination and justification. This long chain is not primarily here to, to tell us about whether some are predestined or not, but rather it's there to give us an unshakable sense of God's purpose and action on our behalf. In other words, God knows us. There is nothing mistaken in us being allied to Jesus, nothing mistaken in God's economy in the way that he's choosing to work with us. So why is the world so disappointing? And we can throw our hands in the air and say, well, God knows. Yes, actually, what Paul is saying, God does know. God knows us and has acted purposefully and in an unshakable way to draw us to himself. And if that's what God does, then what is our response? And that is yearning. Well, friends, we're in a very COVID world, aren't we? Talking about disappointment and circumstances, I discovered after finishing the sermon that, well, the last two minutes were chopped off the end. So here you have the last two minutes of the talk, but recorded very differently. Disappointed in the product? Well, friends, I hope still we can learn from our Lord. The last word that Paul puts in this passage is one that is so important for us, one that we must hear, and it's that word glory, because it frames up for us where we must yearn. If we have seen that God knows us, and there's that unshakable bond, his determination to do good by us, then we see that his determination is that he may glorify us. Now, glory is an odd word. It's often hard to define, but the way that I can best describe it is godness. It's a way of describing all of whom God is. And indeed, we see in this passage that God's determination is to glorify us.
That's an amazing thought, isn't it? That God would draw us close, allow us to see him face to face and to participate in all that he is. And friends, that should provoke in us a deep longing. So if God knows us, we should yearn for him, yearn for this sense of glory. So the, far, the, the last activity, the last practice to help us as we seek to navigate disappointment with life is to cultivate this sense of yearning for the God who knows us. Now here's an activity. Occasionally I think, I wonder what I'd like to be written on my tombstone. What would be my epitaph? The reason I ask that, it often betrays well, where it is that I'm placing my priorities. And if God knows me and his determination is to glorify me, then maybe my epitaph should be, God was enough. God be with you. Amen. And so we respond to God's word as we say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We pray the prayer of the day. God of freedom, you have broken the tyranny of sin and sent the spirit of your son into our hearts. Give us grace to dedicate our freedom to your service, that all people may know the glorious liberty of the children of God through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we turn now to our prayers of intercession for the world, the church, and the people. God of our hearts and homes, thank you for your presence through this week. Some parts of the week have been good. We give thanks for the telephone conversations family Zoom times, and quiet times. Some parts of the week have been difficult. More time alone than was good for us. Times of anger and frustration. Times when we were not at our best. We remember these times now. Take the rag bag of our everyday lives, we pray, and work upon it with your patient grace, transforming us slowly into the likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ. Send forth your Spirit, Lord, 
and and renew renew the face face of the the earth. God of our health and happiness, we know you are committed to our being well and our well-being. We pray for those we know who are ill, lost or lonely or facing some other major problem. These people we name before you now. And we pray that they and we may find help and healing on our journey to you. Send forth your spirit, Lord, and And renew renew the the face face of of the the earth. earth. God of our city, our town, our district, and our nation. Thank you for the women and men who give themselves in political and civic life, for emergency and medical personnel and advisors in this crisis. May we support their efforts to bring about a community which is healthy and safe for all. Help us to recognize whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is lovely, and see it as part of your good plan and purpose to make all things new. Send forth your spirit, Lord, and And renew renew the the face face of the earth. earth. God of our resilient but damaged world, we have survived so much of our own stupidity in war and greed and the abuse of our planet. And all the time you were asking us to enlist in your kingdom, that better world that both lies within and surrounds our own. Help us to live as true citizens of that homeland and to make the case for peace and justice and care for the good earth in every corner of the kingdom. Send forth your spirit, Lord, and and renew renew the the face face of of the the earth. God of the universe, your renewing spirit refreshes the farthest shores of creation and you never rest from your endless purpose of bringing all things together in Christ. In the cross we see your pain as we resist your love. In the resurrection, we see your inexhaustible life. Help us to let in the energy and joy of the resurrection. So may our lives contribute to that glorious goal as you send forth your spirit, Lord, and And renew renew the the face face of of the earth. earth. We conclude our prayers with the morning collect. We join together. Eternal God and Father, by whose power we are created and by whose love we are redeemed, guide and strengthen us by your spirit that we may give ourselves to your service and live this day in love to one another and to you Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us praise the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. The peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.